Historically, society's concepts of gender have been largely shaped by their religions. For the past few millennia in the West, this has been in the form of Christianity. However, this same pattern is ubiquitous to human civilization. Notions such as gender complementarity and a spiritual dimension to gender, sexuality, and human relations can be found around the world and across human history. These are seen to form an integral part of the social institutions and norms of the cultures in which they are found. However, in the last half century, this trend has begun to be supplanted by a new trend largely unique to Western civilization. With the advent of the sciences, it was believed that everything had a material explanation, which naturally included biological sex. The account of the material sciences is that sexual dimorphism is the product of natural selection, which in turn is driven by genetics, which in turn is driven by the material interactions of unconscious molecules. Given that this material account of gender is devoid of any intentionality or purpose, it has led to a nihilistic view of gender, sexuality, and human relations. These ideas first manifested socially in the form of the radicalism and extremism of the 1960s. Since then, atheists and nihilists, lacking any transcendent reference point, have taken them in the direction of anime and social destructionism. Um, I, um, I mean, I agree, it's a no-brainer that, uh, that we should have the right to marry. But uh, I also think equally that it's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist. So, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that causes my brain some trouble. Uh, and, um, and part of it, why it causes me trouble is because uh, fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we're going to do with marriage when we get there. You know, because we lie that the institution of marriage is not going to change. And that is a lie. The institution of marriage is going to change, and it should change. Um, and again, I, I don't think it should exist. Um. As this disintegration has progressed, it has led to extreme illiberalism, antisocial attitudes, and even blatant psychopathic behavior. Thus, to correct the social cataclysm in the making, it may be necessary to re-examine the foundations of these ideas to see where they went wrong. But this is easier said than done. At first glance, the material account seems complete, but appearances can be deceiving. Material accounts are good at explaining biology, but not psychology or phenomenology. At best, they can account for material correlates, but not phenomenology itself, as seen in the famed hard problem of consciousness. In reference to gender, this distinction is recognized by gender theory in the distinction it makes between sex and gender. Sex is seen as biological, whereas gender is seen as mental or psychological. Given that human beings are first and foremost minds, the origins of gender as a mental phenomenon rather than a biological one need to be accounted for, for the material explanation to be valid. However, for the reason given before, this is impossible. And they begin to tell us at these gatherings, they said, in your lifetime you're going to see things happen. It was strange when they said it in the 1950s and 1960s, but now it seems very clear, but then it was unusual. They said, you're going to see a time in your life, men are going to become women. They said, the great spirit, he's going to make a man on the earth. He made him a man, but this man is going to say, I know more than the great spirit. I'm going to change myself to be a woman. And they will even nurse children. They said, the great spirit's going to make a woman on this earth. She's going to say, I know more than the great spirit. I want to be a man. And she will be physically a man. This sounded strange. To account for gender as a mental phenomenon, one needs to find its origins, and to do that, one needs a broader metaphysics than naive materialism. Given the incoherence of dualism due to the interaction problem, and that our fundamental physics is giving way to an idealistic picture of the world, the logical starting point is idealism. So the questions then arise, how do individuated minds come to be, and how does gender arise as a property of those minds? When we answer these questions from an idealist philosophy, we find interestingly that they recover the Christian teaching on the subject. On idealism, if we start at the beginning, we have just God's mind and its contents. However, given that this is a single conscious system, there is no individuation. To create an individual mind from the contents in God's mind, some of the consciousness needs to be stamped out much like how a cookie is cut out of dough. Once this is done, the outline of the cookie perfectly complements the outline of the dough it was stamped out of. This produces an individual mind distinct from God, but also produces our first example of units of consciousness displaying complementary aspects. Each unit of consciousness needs the other to complete it and become one. 
Furthermore, the mind would only be created if God desired or valued it. In other words, God would love the individual person he creates. Thus two aspects associated with gender emerge. The two genders complement each other, but are also held together in a love relationship. Here we find the first parallel to Christian teaching. He, referring to Christ, is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1.17-18 Christ is seen here as containing all things within his mind, including the church. However, Christ and the church are also repeatedly described as husband and bride. Thus a pattern emerges of female being cut out of male. Curiously, the same archetype shows up in the Genesis story of Eve being cut out of Adam. In turn, this reveals another pattern associated with gender. God being the creator first loves us, which is why we are created. Without being valued, there would be no intentionality to create. Thus Christ, which is associated with the husband, is seen as initiating the relationship, while the church, which is associated with the bride, is seen as being receptive towards it. Interestingly, this description of the masculine as initiating, and the feminine as receptive, is mirrored in actual psychological studies. In 2011, a poll of college students showed that 93% of women surveyed wanted to be asked out by men, whereas 83% of men wanted to ask out women. In regards to the complementary nature of gender, the cookie-cutter analogy also replicates the Christian doctrine concerning marriage. In fact, the archetype in Genesis describes the reason for marriage as being precisely along these lines. The man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2, 23-24 If individuation occurs by one becoming two, then the reason for marriage is the opposite. Rather than being an arbitrary human construct, this is due to the joint origin of said souls. The two complementary souls merge back into one as they move closer to their source in God. Thus every male would have his female counterpart, and every female her male counterpart. However, this individuation of gendered minds is not contained to psychology alone. Material explanations of the world are limited to reductionist accounts, and thus prefer a bottom-up explanation of the world. On an idealist paradigm, however, God contains everything, and yet is a single undivided being. Thus the individuation of smaller parts only occurs as a result of the whole creating the parts in a top-down fashion, rather than the parts creating the whole. Since all of creation would be mental, any individuated structure in existence must be treated as something along the lines of a program, rather than a material object. Thus the pattern becomes generalized into a principle for everything in existence, rather than only conscious agents. Gendered units would thus form a fractal structure comprising everything in existence. Rather than being a random accident of nature, each cookie-cutter outline would have its twin silhouette to complement it, forming something of an Escher-like tapestry. Protons and electrons, for instance, share complementary charges and attract each other. The source of charge, in turn, is the zero-point field. A positive charge would necessarily leave a negatively charged hole, and the both would comprise a Dirac pair. DNA molecules are comprised of twin chains of base pairs, each complementing the other, and both needing to chemically bond to each other in order to replicate. This could also, in principle, be extended to complementary sexes in biology. If both reality and gender are mental, sex could never be fully dissociated from gender, as gender theory suggests. Rather than being distinct from gender, biological sex would have a gender as well, being a mind program simulated on consciousness rather than a material object. When applied to human social conventions, this accounts for the basis of traditional marriage. Man and woman would form complementary halves, not just psychologically, but biologically as well, and thus would need to unite along the same lines. In turn, marriage forms the foundation for the separate but related topic of Christian sexual morality. To replicate the Christian teachings on sexual morality in their entirety, the concepts in this video will need to be combined with those in Privatio Boni and A Priori Derivation, and Through a Mirror Darkly. However, this will be the subject for a future video. If you like this video, subscribe and support me on Patreon. And don't forget to check out my novel, Alaris, The Lances of Light, on Amazon Kindle in the description below. You can find us on Facebook as well at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism.